Hello and welcome to the Commonweal Policy Podcast. I'm Craig DL. I'm the Head of Policy at Commonweal. This is episode 100 of the Policy Podcast. I honestly couldn't have imagined we'd get this far uh, when I when I started it up. And this week, the special guests on the show as all of you. I've decided that we should do a... a a Q&A special for the one, episode 100, so I put a call out to ask, what would you like to ask me? And we have been bombarded with questions. I'm, we're going to answer as many of them as I, as, uh, I can. Um, I do apologise in advance if we don't get to one that you've sent in. Um, there, there, there have been too many just to fit into a single show. Um, but to help me out with this q and I'd like to welcome once again to the show... Um, Ellen DL. <laughs> Hello. Thanks. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for, for being my interrogator for this week. Yeah, I'm representing the general public today, grilling you. That's great. <laughs> <laughs> Always fun. <laughs> so, how are we starting? Um, I think we'll start with Rob's question, which is essentially, do you have any good rebuttal to the way that Jers is used against the case for independence? Ah, Jers, our annual financial self-flagellation I have to admit, I'm probably one of the couple of people in this country who have been responsible for elevating Gers to the, the political stramash that it is. Um, so I, I apologise for that. Um, and and yeah, it's true. It, it, every August it comes around and we see the headline figures and there's a couple of days of, headline, uh, of, of news about how terrible everything is and what does Gers mean for the case for independence essentially not as much as some people would like to think. The thing about GERS is, no matter what it shows, what it is actually recording is the finances of a region of the UK that we call Scotland. And there are very significant implications about what about measuring, you know, a region of a country rather than a country in its own right. Um, you know, the, 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 the fact of independence will change a lot about the finances of Scotland. And more so once we start making changes to to the country. And one of the issues with the UK in particular is it is an extremely centralised economy. All of the regions of the UK, if you measure them with gers like statistics, and this has been done in, in previous years, look terrible, except for London and the South East, because that's where the economic policy of the UK is concentrated. And we know this is true because even Boris Johnson accepts it. He has he's built his his manifesto in his current government on this levelling up idea, you know, trying to improve the economy of the north of England, which, if anything, suffers even worse than Scotland because they don't have a devolved government. Um, so what does Gers mean for independence? Not much. What does it mean for the UK? It means that the UK does not serve Scotland. And that is the key rebuttal to this. If the, the the challenge is if Scotland looks this bad as a member of the UK, what do the unionists propose to do about it? I think that was pretty thorough. Yeah. <laughs> Shall we move on to the second question? Yes. Why do you think the SNP think that a Section Thirty order and Westminster permission is the only route to independence? Oh. I this is do. a question that got asked by Susan, and it's obviously mm. one that's been floating around the movement for several years now. Yes, uh, a very, very good one as well. It's one that um, we've talked about before in this podcast, and we've we've written um, extensive articles about it. In fact, the two of us have written articles about this. Um, there are different ways of, of, of reaching the point of independence democratically. Um, one of them is that kind of sanctioned referendum where we get permission from Westminster to hold the referendum and they promise to abide by the result, You know, similar to the way the 2014 referendum was held. Note that that wasn't a binding referendum in the legal sense. The Edinburgh Agreement was not a piece of legislation. It was a gentlemanly contract between the, the, the two campaigns. They agreed to abide by the results. But otherwise, legally, it was a non-binding referendum. So that talk about binding or binding ref non-binding referendums is a bit of a misnomer. Other mechanisms might be possible. There's talk of this unsanctioned referendum where the Scottish government simply holds a referendum itself without permission. Um, we don't know if that is possible under the, the, the current constitutional arrangements under the devolved powers. We don't know if it's not possible. It would be really good to find out. 
there have been attempts to mount a, a legal challenge to clarify the UK's constitution to to try and determine this, although that challenge it was brought by private individuals, it was knocked out because the situation was still hypothetical at that point. <laughs> although 24 hours after that, the Scottish government announced that they were going <laughs> to push forward with an, an uh, with an independence referendum bill, so it stopped being hypothetical. Go figure. This was after fighting against the court case. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit of a bee in my bonnet. Um, we could have that, that unsanctioned referendum. Other mechanisms, such as a plebiscite, you know, have it going to the, the country via a Westminster general election or a Scottish parliamentary election or possibly even pro-independence politicians walking out of their respective parliamentary chambers and forcing by-elections. These are other mechanisms that could demonstrate democratic will for independence. Uh, you could have what, something that has been done in Scotland before, in the 1950s, there was the National Covenant, which was just an, an unofficial petition to sign up and say that you were demanding independence. These are the kind of things that, again, would demo democratically express will. However, they all have their various pros and cons. Um, I will link to a, an article I wrote in my personal blog that, that goes through all of them. But there's something that they all have in common, even the sanctioned referendum. And that is, ultimately, we need to get the Westminster government to the negotiating table to accept the results. If they agree to a sanctioned referendum, then implicitly they, they will have agreed to the result and they will come to the table. If we take any of the other routes, we have to ensure that they will accept that result and they will come to the table, they will negotiate independence and we will become an independent country. If they don't, we could be left in the situation of possibly declaring a unilateral declaration of independence, UDI, and becoming a country like Kosovo or Somaliland where... We might well have all the functions and trappings of, an, of a state, but we can't interact with other countries on a legal footing. We're not really independent because nobody recognises us. Worst case, we could end up like Catalonia, where the, the, the Westminster government reacts very badly to a UDI. And less we dwell on that possibility, the better. It's not something I want to, I want to see happen in Scotland. So... I would like to move the discussion away from what is the options for referendums or other democratic expressions of independence to how do we pressure the Westminster government to abide by the democratic will of Scotland, no matter what event we choose to mark it. A referendum will happen when it is easier for Boris Johnson to say yes to one than to say no to one. Right now, he gains points in the polls among his supporters when he talks tough to the Scotch. When he is seen to be hammering the, 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 the independence cause or sticking up for the union. The moment that stops being true, the moment we are more hassled than it's worth, we will become independent. So that is, that's, I'll, I'll link to another article that I've written on other ways that we can do that. Um... But that's the essence of, of, of the independence campaign. How do we not just de not just generate the democratic will for independence by convincing people to, to, to vote for it, but how do we convince the UK government that letting go of Scotland is easier than keeping a, keeping a hold of us? Right. Um, there's a question from Andrew who asked if you, Craig, could take steps now to empower local councils using only currently devolved powers, what would they be? That is a really good question. Um, the first step I would do is is create local councils. We, right now we have a regional level of government. Um, by any sort of normal measure as measured by, by other European countries. We don't have municipal level governance the way that, that normal European countries do. So we are lacking a lot of democracy in country. Scotland is one of the most centralised countries in the developed world in that respect. So we need a, an actual local tier of government. Um, the second thing I would do is have a serious think about the, the where the 
the various local, local and national taxes are administered. Our regional government has less control over its own finances than most governments in Europe. It's heavily reliant on, um, on, on the block grant from, from Holyrood. I would hate for it to be in the situation that essentially local governments can make the same complaint of Holyrood as Holyrood makes to Westminster. Our hands are tied, there's nothing we can do. So we, we really should have a good think about where tax and other powers are administered. I would like to see a, a principle of subsidiarity where all powers are held at the local level of government unless a case is made to push them up to the regional or national level or international. And only while that case makes sense do those powers are those powers devolved up. If the case stops being made, the powers drop back down. You can make it, there are several powers that do make sense to, to administer nationally, but I would like to see that discussion of what actually makes sense to do it as local as possible. Finally, on a purely policy level, and one, can, one that could be done very quickly, Scottish councils now have the power to nationalise their bus networks, but they don't have the finances or the support from Hollywood to do it. That would be a good step. <laughs> this is a campaign that's been pushed by, by uh, Get Glasgow Moving, by, by Commonweal and by other groups. As we, you know, we, we need the equivalent of Lothian buses in all 32 of our local authorities. So that's something that can be done essentially immediately. What about the coherence between the different regional local councils? Mm. Um, because obviously if you devolve all the powers to all the councils, would that mean that they coordinate with each other still? Or would there be, for example, vastly different fees for removing the trash? Yeah, this is a good point. This is something that often comes up when you're talking about centralisation and decentralisation. If you if you centralise too much, you end up with policy by dictat. The, 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 the national leader is, is taking control of, of local affairs. Decentralise too much, you get the postcode lottery. Um, where where you uh, where you live, you can have vastly different services and fees. Um, so there's a, that that there is a balance there. Um, you can come up with compromise positions. For example, uh, one of the policies that we've advocated recently is to scrap council tax and replace it with a property tax that is based on a percentage of the value of your home. And we have advocated that that should be in local control. But what you could do. National government could set a national rate and then give councils the, the power to adjust it up or down within a band of that national rate, which is quite similar to the way that income tax used to work in Scotland for at least for a couple of years. Uh, Westminster set the income tax rate and the Scottish government had the power to vary it up or down within a band. So that can moderate the possibility of two neighbouring local authorities having vastly different rates when it comes to tax. But this is, this is ultimately something that, that has to be discussed uh, when, when you are having that, that talk about where, where powers should be administered and what they should be. Okay, okay. I could hear you talk about that for a long while, um, but I guess we'll move on to the next question. Um, the Rosanin asked, the environmental impact of a four-day week will be significant, but could the same benefits be gained by hybrid working where uh, where we only commute to the office two or three times a week? That is a really good question. Um, I could spend a podcast on that. I could write a policy paper on that. Um, one of the, the, the goals from the Scottish Government uh, just now is to reduce car journeys by 20%. Um, and it seems fairly obvious that you could reduce the commuting traffic in Scotland by 20% just by moving commuters onto a four-day week. Um, but you could also do it by, yes, having that hybrid hybrid working. Um, one of the considerations, actually, is, is um, what happens to energy bills and energy uh, heating use when you're, when you're working from home. Um, both from a fuel poverty standpoint, because if you're having to heat your house to work in it, then effectively you're transferring the cost of the heating from your workplace to your home, from your employer onto you. And that has quite significant implications for things like fuel poverty. On the other hand, in general, homes tend to be better insulated and, and operate at better heat efficiency than offices do. 
So maybe working from home, while it's transferred the cost to you, can reduce energy use uh, from uh, from heating buildings. So it's a very complex and multifaceted question. Where are the, the all the other environmental impacts, and where do they land, and who pays for them? Very complex question. Um, and that's before we even get into the merits of the two policies themselves, um, because not every job can be worked from home. Not every home can be effectively worked from. And we live in a, a very small house and we feel the pressure of, of working from home, uh, often working in the same room, often having to do public meetings and having to adjust our schedules around those public meetings because you, you don't want two meetings in the same room at the same time. Um, not everybody has that level of freedom because maybe they rent and the landlord is not going to let them convert a spare room into an office. Or have a spare room. Or have a spare room at all. Um, so so for folk in that situation, maybe you have to go to the office. Um, there's also the cultural aspects of office work versus homework. It's, it's a very, very good question. I would love to open this one up to a discussion. If anyone else has any thoughts on this, please get in touch. I think that's actually one that really is worth um, having a dedicated um, public meeting about to discuss where people are in their own situations on, on, on working. All that said, I am very precious about my Fridays off. I work a four-day week. I have ever since I started at Commonweal, and I can't imagine going back to a five-day week. So if you get the chance to go to a four-day week, do it. <laughs> I mean, this is not an either-or question, as, yeah. as I understand it. It's a and question. Are we able to do the four-day working week and commit to only going to the office two or three times a week? This is very true. Um I think it's interesting to discuss all of these together. Um, but it's also interesting in the context of the four day week discussion that is currently ongoing where people are saying, well, the four day week is a very nice idea and we support nice ideas, but are not willing to go very far with it. Maybe yeah. you've got a couple of words on how we can actually get this off the ground. Yeah, it's, I mean, right now the Scottish government is looking at a, a small pilot project where they're going to fund companies to investigate a four-day week. I'm not entirely sure what that that means in practice. Um, so it will be interesting to see that. It's not a full commitment to encouraging a four-day week everywhere, so there's still steps to go. Some places will adapt to it better than others. Um, my job at Commonweal is essentially a desk job at an office. All I need is a keyboard and an internet connection. I can do that in, in multiple places. I've even worked from Germany. Well, <laughs> well that was strictly legal be before the Brexit transition period. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you added that. Um, whereas my previous job in, in laser production... That's obviously something I couldn't do from home at all. Um, but it's, it would also be interesting to look at those companies and even consider how their office staff, whether they could work from home or whether they would move to a hybrid working um, model. That might suit their job, but maybe that affects the way they interact with the, the folk in production who now can't just go and, go into the, go and speak to HR or someone else in the office environment about something that's happening in the in the factory. So, so yeah, it's, it's, it's a very interesting question, but it's one that I think we're going to have to answer because a lot of folk have got got some a, a lot of benefit out of, of discovering working from home um, and the culture of working from home is a lot more normalised. I think it's here to stay and, as you say, um, the, the environmental impacts mean that it's worth clinging on to. Great. Um, the next question comes from Alistair. Um, what role should elected politicians be playing to move us towards independence? Hmm, that's a very good question, and it's one that I'm going to take a slightly roundabout answer uh, way of answering because it's not really the politicians who should be driving this. It's our local campaign groups. If if the politicians have a role, it's a it's a servant, not master. We shouldn't be waiting for the politicians to come down from on high and tell our local campaign group to what to do on, on some day of action or whatever. We should be organising that day of action and telling the politician, turn up, you're needed. Um, because they, you know, elected elected officials can have a bit of, of, of weight 
there that they should be throwing around, throwing around, and we can help guide them in uh, where to throw it. Um, this seems like a idea ready for the twenty first century. Mm. Up until now, politicians seem to be perceived as these, um, you know, up on high to be respected figures of authority uh, after they've been elected yeah. for several years. And you're, what you seem to be suggesting, and also what I'm seeing around Commonwealth, is that local groups becoming very, very insistent with their elected officials just get somewhere, because that's their actual job. Yeah. Yeah, and again, this is why we are so much in, in favour of more democracy, more local democracy, because the more local democracy, the more local democracy is the more quote-unquote normal people find themselves involved in it and the more relatable they are. And, you know, it's your your MP who lives in a distant place and, and you only know through a, a, a face and an email address is one thing, but your local councillor next door, you can talk to them much more easily and you can you can get them engaged in local issues. So what you're saying is it's much easier to stand on the toes of somebody living down the road from you than somebody far, far away. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. There's that famous quote of uh, when Scotland had a parliament of its, of its own, we could aye throw, throw stones at them when they when they were in the good bairns, um, but nobody's arm can reach the, the length of London. Yeah, um, you guys make sure that from the 1st of October you don't throw any stones or don't go anywhere near your elected representatives. I'm also not advocating getting the Edinburgh not mob to tear up those lovely cobblestones and throw them at politicians. That would both be vandalism and grievous bodily harm. Don't do it. <laughs> don't do it, but don't let yourself be stopped from protesting, is all I'm saying. Yeah, um, but even, even within that, we, we do have politicians in places like the House of Commons um, and there have been suggestions of maybe maybe pro nd politicians should just up and leave that place in, in, in demonstration. As I pointed out in the, the, the series that will link the law on, on what do we do to pressure Westminster into accepting independence, these politicians could be doing things to put the pressure on Boris Johnson directly. Um, I would like to see a, a good study of civil obedience. What can the, the, the pro ND MPs do within the rules of Parliament that really cause havoc in the House of Commons, gum up the works and, and, and generally cause a nuisance? That's before we get into the civil disobedience thing of, of, of breaking the rules by doing things like grabbing the Queen's mace and running away with it. <laughs> to... I think one point worth mentioning here is probably that it's not a partisan thing. No. Whatever you want to happen within yeah. your community and for Scotland, you have the right to go to all elected representatives yes. about. And quite often, like we've just seen, for example, with Monica Lennon yep. um, and the National energy company uh, there's a suggestion coming into the scottish parliament to return the scottish energy company to uh, an active policy status yes. rather than axing it like has just happened and it turns out this is a labor person who just buys into the idea of a national energy company um that then fails in parliament to get through because it's being considered a partisan issue when you consider it taking a couple of steps back, an independent Scotland with a national energy company is a vision for the future. And it, it's, it seems ironic that a Labour person would come and suggest such a powerful tool for transformation and for an independent Scotland. It's not about party here. Yeah. It's, it's, it's also a bit disappointing in the, in the sense that Nicola Sturgeon had a really sort of well-received speech talking about the need for a, colleg a more collegiate Scottish Parliament uh, where anyone could bring ideas to be considered and then it's kind of knocked down on party lines. Um, so maybe, maybe the Scottish Government's not quite ready to step up to its own rhetoric on that point. We'll see. Um, another point is on, on that, that idea of... of, of the duty that politicians have towards their their constituents is that you, you do have a right to approach your your politicians, your councillors, MSPs, MPs, and they must listen to you. Um, you know they might not agree with you, and they might choose to ignore you when once you've finished talking. I've certainly had that experience with MPs and uh, with politicians in the past. Um, but one thing I would like to see. Um, speaking from purely my policy hat at Commonweal, is more people taking Commonweal policy papers to their local local representatives and saying this, I want this, uh, regardless of who that politician is or whatever that par their party is, because if the constituents 
are lobbying for the things that they want. You know, there's a lot more pressure there for it to happen than there is for some think tank or some lobby group doing it. Yeah, quite frankly, if you're listening to this podcast, you're already politically more interested than the average person on the street. But there's relatively few people who would ever get in touch with their elected representatives from the general population unless there was a, a, you know, an outstanding case. You can use your position as somebody who's politically switched on to make a case to people. And especially in terms of the, you know, the parties that are currently opposition parties, um, that their folk have a lot more time on their hands. <laughs> yeah. So they might have more time to listen to you. It's really important that you take this the step to make people work for you because yeah. you represent the electorate. And that's ultimately more powerful than any individual elected politician. Yeah, so th- this is an idea that's not just come off the top of my head. It's one that we've been working on for a wee while. We'll be talking about it a lot more in a lot more detail in the near future. So keep in touch so there's one last question Um, i actually kind of dipped into it earlier but brian asks why has the scottish government shelved plans for the national energy company oh i will be writing about this in this week's uh, commonweal newsletter please sign up to the newsletter and you will receive it every thursday morning um the short version is i think they got spooked um the 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 policy had been there it was announced in 2017 to to great fanfare um, although the policy that the, the government advocated was a lot less than the one that they were given. They wanted to create a new energy supplier, someone who would buy energy from the market and then sell it to you. We are seeing right now in the energy crisis the weakness of that. When energy prices spike, those, those suppliers cannot buy the energy to give to their customers and they end up going bust. Just as we, Just before we started recording this, another two energy companies in the UK announced that they were going bust and another one has has ceased taking on new customers. An energy company needs to be both a supplier and a generator. It needs to own its own assets where it can generate electricity. That way it's not having to buy it. It's, it's, it's shielded from the vulnerability of those prices on the market and it can keep going. Um, most of the, the public energy companies in the rest of Europe are generators and suppliers. Um, but what happened with the, the, the energy supplier policy is, was in 2019 there was a, another energy spike and the energy companies that the Scottish government that were looking at as models for this went bust <laughs> and they got spooked and they shelved the, 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 the plans for it um, uh, well paused the plans uh, till a few weeks ago when they announced that they had cancelled them completely Within a week of that announcement, the SNP conference almost unanimously, like 98.9% of, of, of delegates there, voted to bring the policy back. The amendment that you mentioned earlier, um, Ellen, uh, brought in by Monica Lennon, would have taken the Net Zero Nation uh, bill, uh, Net Zero Nation no- motion um, in Parliament this week, which was kind of a and do nothing motion. It was kind of a, the Parliament agrees that the Scottish government's already doing nice things. It, it wasn't really introducing anything new. Monica Lennon's amendment would have introduced the the urgent need to set up an energy company along the lines that we have advocated, both a generator and a supplier. Who voted and, for it? And it would have supported things like local cooperatives, local municipal companies, and things like that. Um, it was voted for by Labour MSPs. Um, it was like 19 of the 22 Labour MSPs, or three, three were absent from the chamber for whatever reason. You don't always get a full chamber at these things. Every other politician from every other party was either absent or voted against, and that includes the SNP and the Greens. Um, as I say, I'll be talking about this more in my newsletter article later this week. So please, I'll, I'll leave a link to sign up to that. Um, so I think that brings us to the, the end of our, our, our list um, I, I am sorry we haven't managed to get through everybody's question we had so many we, we had to pick uh, just a few of them to get through we only have half an hour of show and we are rapidly getting to the, the end of that but this has been fun I really enjoy taking questions and, and answering them it's, it's far more um, interesting to me than standing up somewhere and giving a speech because I'm much more interested to hear what you lot are interested in rather than just 
expounding on my own views all the time. So we have to do one of these again. Maybe a hundred, maybe episode 150. We'll see. <laughs> um, so thank you everybody for listening. As always, Commonweal as an organisation is supported entirely by folk like yourselves, giving us one-off donations, regular donations, or buying merchandise, books and t-shirts from our shop. Uh, we don't get government funding. We're not funded by um, by companies we don't even have adverts on our website so all of the policies that we produce are, are completely supported by folk like yourselves if you can help us produce the next set of policies then we really appreciate your help um please share this podcast send it around everybody you know and um, we really appreciate you listening in and we hope to see you again next week mm-hmm.